Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Whole Organ Mapping Using AI and Light Sheet Microscopy. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Milton Yee Biotech. To learn more, visit MiltonYeeBiotech.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Ali Aturk, Director of Heimholtz Institute for Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine in Munich. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Ali, you may now begin your presentation. Just checking. Yes, we can see your screen. Cool. Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here today sharing our recent research and technologies that we have been developing. And, um, and also, I would like to thank organizers and Milton Biotech for, for this event. Since the beginning of human history, clear that we desire for a longer and healthier life, even an eternal life, which was actually also the theme of the Gilgamesh epic, which is the known uh, for the first, which is the first known literacy of human being. However, throughout the human history, thousands of years, the average lifespan actually was far away from eternal life. It was about 40 years. However, with the advent of modern medicine, we started to live longer and longer, average about 60 in mid 900s. Then nowadays, as you know, we live around 75, 80 average. Because we could tackle infectious diseases with the antibiotics and also could tackle a lot of injury related things, accidents in modern hospital settings. I call this area where we have been um, increasing the human lifespan in the last few hundreds by our science era one or by a current where we are. However, you can see now the curve is flattening because now we cannot tackle a lot of diseases that are related to aging from ischemic heart diseases, stroke, neurodegeneration, lung diseases, cancer, and diabetics. So, well, it's also clear to us, I guess, as a scientist, if we have enough time, we will tackle all of the all of these diseases one by one. So we could already tackle almost tackle a big big challenge like coronavirus in a short time. But we are also quite optimistic we will be able to tackle these complicated diseases in some decades, in some centuries. I mean, if you say, for example, given three four hundred years, in three four hundred years, potentially all of us would think we will be able to solve all these diseases. So. 
Then as a scientist, then I ask myself, what can we do to accelerate scientific discoveries that we can achieve the progress of 300 years in the next 20 to 30 years? So if we were to do that, we would be reaching to biosciences era two. So call it biofuture. So that has been actually primary vision of my science since I started my lab around six years ago. But how are we going to reach there? How are we going to achieve this um, increase again in the curve? Well, many um, intellectuals and scientific thinkers, as well as the authors from Homedeus, Yuval Harari, and Dan Brown in the book in Origin, they suggest that we could achieve acceleration in, in technologies and science by merging fields, merging different technologies. So this actually has been also the core of my research over the years, that we could uh, put together different sciences to achieve a significant acceleration, sometimes 1,000 times, sometimes millions of times, actually, in data analysis with AI, as I would mention. So today I would like to give you examples of the imaging technologies that we developed for biosciences combined with AI technologies and some of the engineering efforts. Hopefully in a future talk I can give, talk, give you examples of our nanotechnology related research. So now back to science. As you know, we are an organism of interconnected systems from head to toe we are wired with vessels nerves, bones, other systems, it's clear that it is affecting one part of the body, will affect the rest. However, in the lab, we rarely study diseases at whole body scale. So if you're interested in brain, we take out the brain, make slices, look at the um, cells and plaques, for example, or if you're interested in the cancer in lung, again, take out the lung and uh, make sections and look at the cancer cells. That means we are actually ignoring the rest of information throughout the body. Ideally, we should be able to see the whole uh, scale of the disease and treat the whole spectrum throughout the body. So what are the tools actually can do uh, whole body scale studies? If we focus on imaging tools, we have on the one side MRI, fMRI, detail like imaging modalities where we can see gross anatomy over time, but it's not informative at cell level. If you want to see cells and molecules, we can do tissue sections, histology, or serial EM. However, this is very time consuming and it's very hard to scale it to a whole organ and almost impossible for a whole organism like whole mouse body. So the technologies that we have been developing, which I would like to focus today, so-called optical tissue clearing technologies combines these two arms so we can study whole anatomy at subcellular level in a cost and time efficient way. So what is tissue clearing? As you know, standard histology relies on sections and labeling the sections and looking at under the microscope, which has been good for most of the time However, if you want to study complicated structures of vessels, nerves, and diseases extending from organs to organs, this is not sufficient. To overcome this problem, we and others have been developing optical clearing technologies where we convert opaque biological tissue in transparent structure. So you can think that it's converting milk into water. Now we can see through and scan through to obtain 3D information of intact biological specimens, really at the cellular level. So when I started my lab, we um, decided to focus on whole mouse bodies as the primary animal model used in the labs that we could study diseases at whole body scale. In 2016, we published UDISCO technology where we could make the whole mouse body transparent with organic solvents for the first time, but also we could uh, achieve imaging a mouse body with a fluorescent microscopy at that time for the first time. 
Then in three years, we published a uh, rediscovered technology where we could enhance the signal of the tissue of interest about 100 times, so it becomes more visible. In this third picture, actually the same uh, transgenic animal type 1 GFBM, a subset of neurons expressing GFP for uh, labeling nervous system. You can see on the left in the green picture, we don't see much of a nervous system very uh, little because a lot of autofluorescence from background from muscles and hard to see through bones and skin. On the right hand side, after increasing the signal in the nerves, about 100 times we can see vivid signal in um, coming from neurons throughout the bones and skin, very, very clear. So we discovered technology truly renders almost transparent like a glass. If you put in a solution, actually you don't see it anymore. Here, for example, it's in the solution in the microscope. After placing uh, clear transparent models to light shed microscopes, here we have used Ultra microscope too, which we kind of a bit modified the cham uh, chamber sample holder that we could mount the mouse. After mounting with the laser scanning end to end, we could visualize specific uh, labeled cells. So, as a neuroscientist, I was very interested in first looking at the nervous system of an intact adult mouse. So, here you can see Taiwan GFBM mouse. The green signal shows the nerves. Red shows the muscles and white bones and organs. Now, if I remove the muscles, you see the nerves through the bones. If I remove the bones and organs, you see intact nervous system of an adult mouse. So let's look at this now in a 3D video again. We remove the muscle and we remove the organs and bones. You see the nerves. For example, you can focus any nerve from toe, a single axon, how it's going up towards the um, muscles and forming neuromuscular junctions, axonal bundles coming together, going upwards to the spinal cord, lower level of spinal cord. You can see sensory and motor ganglia, and a lot of nerve innervations throughout the chest and internal organs, and you see enormous uh, branching of the axons through the forelimbs here to the toes and uh, muscles. So using this technology now on intact mouse, more than 10 centimeters, we could get the detailed information of neural connectivity. So now we want to apply this, of course, in a DC setting that we could um, see something that we could not see. For that, we did a traumatic brain injury uh, on the right somatosensory cortex of the mouse. So let me show it here. We injured a, an injury, induced an injury. And then instead of looking at only brain, as any other lab would do, we also look at the whole body. Looking at the whole body, we, we could, we were able to see, for example, and changes not only in the brain, but throughout the body. Now, please focus the nerves innervating shoulder muscles here. I will show you the brain injury versus uh, control case. You can see in the brain injury case, axonal connectivity is significantly reduced compared to controls. So we are away from the brain. We are looking at the nervous system in the periphery, and clearly it is affected with the brain injury. So I guess the simple experiments already show that if you want to treat diseases by like even local brain injury, we need to think about whole body, not only just delivering drugs into the brain, which we always try to do, but maybe a lot of problems could be already solved throughout the body periphery where it cause additional uh, complications to the patient. When we started um, imaging mouse um, bodies with v disco technology, we were also very interested in lymphatic connection, which uh, was um, about five years ago rediscovered by Jonathan Kidnes, Kari Aletola, and Michael Negerga. You could see in this uh, isolated skull prep some of the uh, 
menangeal vessels in green. So we said, well, to be able to study these connections by, between skull and the brain, uh, we don't need to remove, if we were to use VDSCO technology to brain from skull, but we could do it in text settings. You can see now the same uh, PROX1 EGFP mouse where they uh, clearly sagittal sinus, the signal, and the other connected uh, branches of lymphatic vessels. Not only lymphatic vessels, but we could also see the uh, n n immune cells inside here, labeled by double transgenic 6, CCR1, and CCR2. So you can see this um, individual um, macrophages and neutrophils in this lymphatic vessels in the sagittal sinus dura region. So when we have been studying this um, anatomical structures in the head of the mouse, well, we observed actually that there are some uh, connections from skull marrow to the meningeal surface of the brain. So you can see here this yellow dash. So these are actually some small vascular channels, which we name them as skull meningeal connections. And you can see actually this is a, this is a transgenic animal labeling neutral fields. Of course, in the bone marrow, there are thousands of them, but also some throughout these channels and the meningeal vessels. So not only in the moss, but also we could observe the same structure here, structures in the human Cal samples isolated with meninges. You can see again um, from skull marrow from right side to the left connection and the immune cells, IBA1 labeled microglia and macrophages, macrophages in this case. So we using this technology now we could dissect out some previously unknown vascular connections connecting um, the skull marrow to the brain surface, skull meningeal connections, which we believe now could be leveraged to treat and uh, diagnose brain diseases from a new perspective, which we are now investigating in an ERC-funded project. When we apply these technologies in the whole mouse body, in the mouse brains and heads, of course, fluorescent microscopy, micrometers, level sections means thousands, even tens and hundreds of thousands of sections. It is terabytes, tens of hundreds of terabytes of data. One cannot analyze this just by simply sitting in front of the computer by clicking or imitate glitters. Therefore, we had to find a much better ways to analyze. Therefore, we focus on machine learning because um, with the rise of now deep learning, clearly, there have been quite advances. They are prone to be now quite um, unbiased compared to human. They have high performance. Um, accuracy could even exceed human um, judgment, and they can be really fast. For example, years of work could be done by human, could be completed now with deep learning algorithms within seconds or minutes. I will give you three examples of such algorithms we developed. First is VESA for vascular uh, segmentation. Second is DeepMac for cancer metastasis and drug targeting and channel technology for mapping um, intercommon organs here for brain and uh, nerve counting. So clearly vessels, especially in the brain, they are very important and their morphology clearly shows any pathology. If there's a tumor, it sees Alzheimer's disease plaque, you will see immediately changes in vascular um, connectivity. So that, therefore we think we thought mapping out the vessels down to microcapillary level in whole mouse brains would be a good way to study diseases. So uh, Mike, uh, a science, biologist scientist together with Johannes, computer scientist, started working on the problem. Mark developed a way to uh, label both large vessels and small vessels, implemented clearing and imaging, and Johannes implemented the deep learning algorithms, which is called VASAP. And uh, you, you can find these algorithms easily available on the paper link. So this is the segmentation of the 
the blood sap of the mouse brain. You can see the blood vessels in cerebellum, in cortex, throughout the mouse brain, but also tiny capillaries in uh, deep brain structures. All these networks are now visible. After scanning, we calculate all the parameters related to morphology, diameter, length, and so on. And by merging to LM Brain Atlas, we then get vascular um, maps of each brain region, more than 1,200 in LM Brain Atlas. For us, another clear, exciting implementation of the clearing technologies was in cancer metastasis. You might know that majority of the patients actually die from the metastasis, not from primary tumor. How that happens, hundreds and thousands of tiny cells splitting from primary tumor, they get into lymph vessels or blood vessels. They are mostly eliminated by immune cells, but some could escape this immune surveillance, exit the blood vessels, and find some niches and hide there. They're resistant to immune cells, and if they're treatment, they're resistant, and then they form large tumor, and then they cause the death in, uh, of the patient. Therefore, actually, it is very critical for us to be able to see this tiny micrometastasis in animal models where we study them, and then to make sure if there's drug treatment, all these tiny metastases, they are treated, they are targeted. However, there have been no technology you can see this tiny few cell cancer metastasis or even the drug targeting. For example, if you think about imaging modalities, bioluminescence, MRI, computer tomography, all will give you similar images. To be able to see something, you have to have thousands of cells together. No way close to seeing few cells, cancer cells, can, um, cancer stem cells, maybe. So with that, we could overcome this problem. Together with Rainer Zeidler, Björn Manza, we start working on the problem where we transplanted uh, human memory carcinoma cells. After eight to 10 weeks, we make the animals transparent using the disco and with M cherry expressing cancer cells, along with an therapeutic antibody 6A10, which is conjugated with another fluorophore. Um, and this therapeutic antibody, we know that is um, significantly targeting these tumors already. We wanted to now visualize all these things at the cellular level throughout the mouse body. Imaging and uh, analyzing the whole data with deep learning, which is now called, we call it DeepMac showed us every tiny micrometastasis in treating the mouse body, you see in magenta here, but also quantification related to their size and distribution. For example, in this mouse, uh, in the upper graph, you can see there's about 100 single cell cancer cells, about 120 double cells together and so forth. We could really identify all these types of cancer metastasis. When we look at the data, we observed that about 60% of the metastases, they were smaller than 75 cells size. Very, very small. Actually, 75 cells is the best of any other technology can do. So even then, you can see about two-thirds of uh, cancer metastases cannot be observed in animal models. That is actually quite a drastic lose if you want to study cancer metastasis and understand the pathology in the world of drugs, basically, so far it has been done in a blind way. We can see that. In, in addition to cancer metastasis, we could also see um, antibody targeting. You can see here in cyan, the middle part, which sometimes fully targets the cancer, sometimes partially, and that was for us important to visualize. Now, let me show you standard imaging bioluminescence where the mouse was treated with the antibody. And in the red rectangle there, the lungs are. You see that the antibody, this antibody uh, actually stops the metastasis. Uh, that's the major uh, purpose of this antibody. 
and the, uh, this, metast um, this cancer line usually metastasizes to the lungs. And you can see that this antibody in a standard imaging is working well. Now, potentially, even people can think it's ready to push the clinical trials. However, if you do now a high resolution VD score imaging, you can see in the same mouth there are hundreds of tiny microvetastases which were invisible to uh, standard technologies. Let's look at this in 3D video. You can see the primary tumor close to the leg, the big one, but also hundreds of tiny micrometastases throughout the mouth body, in the muscles, in the bones, some in the kidneys, some in the lungs, and a lot actually in the lungs. You can see down to really single cell throughout the bronchi and clusters of this tumor cell. Not only this metastasis, but also we could see the antibody targeting, as I mentioned. Now you will see if the tumors are there targeted, they are in white, and the ones that are not targeted by, by the therapeutic antibody are using this work. They are in magenta. You can see even an antibody-based treatment could actually miss significant amount of tiny macrometastasis, which we calculated about 20-25%. So imagine then um, if by just looking at the large tumors where they're targeted, if a company, an institution make a decision, this drug is working and they should try it in, in clinic, actually they would be quite mistaken. But only after seeing such a high resolution uh, view, they would understand the drug is not what is not ready. Not only that, but then they, there's a chance to go back and bring a second antibody or, or the third one to cover all the small metastases to make sure now we are ready at the preclinical stage at our best, we can move to the human trials. I believe just implementing this technology in that, in that way can increase double, triple the success rate for oncology in clinical trials, which is about 5% now. So far, I show you um, results from uh, mouse bodies, uh, animal models, but can we apply this to human organs? We want to do it. We tried all the ones that we developed for mouse. They didn't work well for human tissue. There was a problem, and the chemist, uh, Sean, in the lab solved this problem. Problem was um, the standard uh, data on this triton that we use for labeling clearing, they weren't really permeabilizing stiff human tissue. You can see that they have large micellar size and they got stuck on the surface of the human tissue. Then we made a screen and identified chops, a new detergent with small micellar size, and it could very nicely permeabilize stiff old human tissue, make holes, channels, then labeling and clearing solutions could get in. Using this technology, we made whole human eye transparent and look at some dye labeling in autofluorescence. Using light microscopy, you can see the iris and retina, but also the axons behind the eye and the immune cells around. Not only the dyes, but also we could do antibody labeling in one, uh, more than one centimeter thick human uh, uh, brain tissue. Here you can see, for example, IBM one microbially labeled human brain tissue. You can see white matter, uh, gray matter, white matter, gray matter. Um, again, a lot of uh, microglia in the gray matter. Not only microglia, but also the cell bodies, but their processes, they could be identified um, after this large tissue immunolabeling, clearing, and imaging. And we are looking here really under of millions of cells to just even segment them cell bodies and quantify it's close to impossible task again using standard tools from imit fiji or imaris whatever you're using they're all based on filters we could uh, do deep learning based analysis now and that rami develop where we could really segment and count hundreds of millions of cells that are labeled in large human brain tissues. Now we can really do cytoarchitectural map of intact uh, large human brain cells. 
segments. So not only um, the um, mapping of the human brain, but we have been other uh, we have been interested in other applications. So what are those? So we have been very interested in using these technologies for human organ clearing to map all kinds of human organs that we can look at the biology in an unbiased way in health and disease. For example, here we had a kidney from 93 years old person, transparent, and then um, 90, a kidney from 93 years old person, transparent, you can see it's fully transparent, uh, matte behind it, visible. And then we wanted the image here. There was also vessel labeling and cell body labeling. And with standard um, microscopies at that time, that is now um, about one and a half years ago, maybe, we could not image this um, um, such a large tissue, uh, even the available uh, micro microscopes. Then, then we start working with um, Vision at that time, Milton, you know, together to develop a new microscope that we can image large uh, human organs, which actually then turn out to be a new microscope for them that is called the microscope blaze. So there we outlined the needs that we want to have um, a microscope that can handle large samples and scan large samples. You can see here the really big sample holder. We could move it um, several centimeters on, on Y dimension, several centimeters on X and Z. So it was that it enabled us to image this more than 10 centimeters um, length and four or five centimeters thick human kidney tissue. And here is the 3D visualization of this human kidney. You can see green labeling of the capillaries. Magenta labels the large uh, ducts and CN labels autofluorescence and mid sized vessels. And you can see that on the left, there are very nice labeling of the capillaries on the right hand side, so it seems that they're not there. And when we look at the glomeruli in magenta channel, we also see on the right hand side they're not there mostly, but on the left side they are there. So this already tells us that, um, you know, looking at this shows us a very different pathology, actually, which I was talking to Kidney Express. No one could explain to us what we are really seeing, because in a way, no one has seen such a data. So we really start to think about diseases in a different way, as you can see, when we have a complete information. Now we are also studying, of course, different uh, health, more healthy kidney and, and, and different diseases using the same technology. So I briefly mentioned that we are also very interested in mapping the human brain, which is one of the flagship projects of all biosciences. Um, you know, billions of investments in the, in the U.S., uh, more than 12 years brain project started. There's no single map of a human brain yet. I think a clear problem, this organ is so large, it's impossible to cellular details to have using current technologies. So, but now using channel technology, we could also convert whole human brain into transparent structure where you can see if condensed light is going end to end. Now we have optical access to the human brain that we can get the cellular information. Yet we don't have a microscope that is even beyond place. Um, clearly we need here a new microscope. If anyone interested in working on such a project, we would be happy to hear. So, um, but we are already conceptually working on this, uh, solving this problem, how we can uh, image, uh, how we can design, what kind of uh, light sheet microscope we design needed for a such, like, such a large sample. And finally, we are very interested in using this organ clearing imaging as a map to generate new human organs using 3D bioprinting technologies. So what is the connection, you may ask? You know that 3D printers are 3D replicators. That means if you have to provide a 3D map, 
at high resolution that it will be replicated by the machine. If you are talking about human organs and their, their bioprinting, we need then highest resolution map possible that we can replicate the original structure. For us, it will no, it will no use if we just randomly print tissue or if we just put in additional stem cells and they grow and become random structures, they will have very limited use compared to real organization. So using Sherman technology, we could make it transparent and label specific structures. And potentially now we could scale it down and generate printed organoids and also in the near future, hopefully the whole scale of human organ. So I would like to um, end by a summary. Um, we are very passionate about accelerating biomedical discoveries to tackle devastating diseases, to move to biofuture. To this end, we use unbiased technologies. Instead of working on proteins one by one, we use a top-down approach and see all, for example, proteome and transcriptome, and then go from their all structures. So this is, I guess, the, the, the best way not to lose a lot of time. We are also very interested in scaling both, uh, both data acquisition and analysis in the order of thousands, even millions at times. To this end, we utilize whole tissue imaging, as I show you, whole mouse, whole human organ, and clearly AI is another uh, accelerator. And uh, we are using now uh, all these technologies to generate um, engineered tissues that we can model human diseases. For, finally, I'm very excited about personalized medicine um, because it's clear that all diseases are actually different person from person to person, even the cancer cells different in the same person. Clearly, we have to solve most of diseases by at the individual level. Previously, we couldn't do that because we didn't have the tools, let's say the scalable tools. We already, the whole um, cancer, let's say Lyme cancer, the whole concept already takes several decades to study. Uh, for general top as a general topic in thinking studying them on person to person you need tools that you can really do research very quickly so i guess now we are coming to this point with such clearing and ai based anal analysis technology and um we have been working on this um concepts by emerging technologies of different fields as I mentioned, from engineering to AI to biosciences. With that, I want to move to the last animation, which makes me happy. It's beautiful to look at. I believe it's Taiwan GSB and mouse brain, where you can see this connectivity in, in mouse brain after we discover technology, the cortical neurons, but not in the cell bodies and dendrites, but their connections, their spacing is like Moving in a jungle, you see every tree, every branch, every leaf. You have a really good idea about what's going on in this forest. And you can see the tiny connections, axons coming out, how they go through the corpus callosum to the other side of the brain, to deeper brain regions. And we have all this detailed information throughout the whole uh, mouse brain. So we have really a complete, at least for this transgenic animal, we are very close to having a complete neuronal connectivity map at the axon dendrite, even maybe of recent spine level. With that, I would like to acknowledge um, the funding agencies of my research. Most of this research has been done at the LMU, my uh, IST lab, where I still have a lab. But in the last year, we moved to Hamos now, a um, bigger part of the lab focusing on engineering of tissues. And of course, I'm very glad to work with an amazing team of multinations and multidisciplines. We are about 16 countries now, in 24 people. We are engineers, computer scientists, chemists, physicists, biologists, all can kind of expertise tackling the questions together. With that, I would like to end, and I'm happy to take your questions.
information. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question is, uh, it says, where are you able to implement staining with BDISCO? I don't know if it means yeah. were you able or where are you able? So important point, and um, we were able to implement staining in the whole mouse bodies using um, nanobodies. Regular antibodies doesn't work because they're very large. I mean, they partially work, but they don't go into deep tissue such as spinal cord, brain tissue, mostly unlabeled. But using nanobodies, we could label really the whole mouse. If there is a nanobody against a specific protein, you're interested in that works. Of course, small dice, they work well. Cell body labeling, topro tree, PI, vascular labels, dextrons, they work perfectly. If it comes to, of course, specific labeling with large IgG antibodies, there are problems there to be solved. Okay, thank you, Ali. Our next question is, which software do you use to handle really big data, analyze, rendering, and video making? Thank you. So we have a pipeline that actually requires multiple software, currently no single software solution. Um, so what we do is scan, let's say, the whole mouse using Blaze. Then we stitch everything using Arivis. They have a 3D stitching model where you can uh, turn around individual uh, blocks. And then we do animations and 3D visualizations using Imaris, which still is, uh, has a better rendering. I might say other softwares now are catching up, but still they are actually a better one. So this is a bit of a, like a pipeline, I guess should be described in detail in general in our papers. Okay, thank you so much. We have another question. Is there any data for application to visualizing the skin? Is there any application, um, any data for? Uh, I don't understand the question exactly, um, but um, so we did in VDISCO paper, Nature Neuroscience paper, we imaged the um, skin intact mouse with the skin where you can see lymph nodes, for example, you can see hair follicles. There are a lot of lymph nodes embedded into skin. So nerve innervation of the skin. So there are a lot of questions actually can be answered using VDISCO technology now where we can scan a really deep um, throughout the intact skin and underlying layers. And we actually have this data scanned. This, um, um, for the VDISCO paper, the sample. So if the um, person is asking whether this data is available, we are actually happy to ship data. If someone is interested in a specific set of data, we can send them if they want to look at it in 3D and analyze for something. Okay, thank you so much. We have another question. Uh, what are the current limitations of the technique compared to other techniques, like iDISCO or SHIFT? Um, so we, I presented several techniques, so it's hard to judge now which one is being asked. For example, we use a VDISCO technology um, for um, whole mouse clearing imaging, and there is no such an equivalent technology. That's the only one. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we are talking about imaging uh, whole human organs where we use channel technology, again, there is no other te comparable technology. It's the only one. But if we think about application, their application in mouse organs, we can compare them individually to iDisco, uh, where, for example, we, we already compared and reported with vDisco technology, we have better permeabilization and penetration for nanobodies, and the same with channel, comparing using chops in, in human tissue, we can permeabilize the human tissue uh, several fold more than any other clearing uh, um, methods that has been available. So we are also now 
about to publish a handbook. We call it for disco clearing, organic solvents, where people can really have clear ideas of individual applications. Um, compared to uh, shift, hmm, this I don't know if the switch may be meant here, which is multi-round labeling. We don't have any technology yet for multi-round labeling. Okay, thank you, Ali. Our next question is, do you have any ideas as to how you could improve the technology so that you could image whole human brains? It's a good point. Um, well, actually, it's an exciting uh, point. We are working on it. Um, so we had the crazy idea, actually, initially to shrink the human brain to make it like a mouse brain. There was... Um, a vision but didn't work you know sometimes you fail and that was one that we failed we couldn't find any way to make this a human brain you know like 1000 times smaller um but now that means it still shrinks it becomes maybe half size we need to scale up the imaging uh, microscopes have more what we need is more sample holding capacity large opt optics with more working distance, maybe go more um, infrared this part, we can even see deeper. So these are a few ways that we are now trying to put together. But this is really a long-term research. I mean, um, not very easy one to tackle, but also I think it's a fair one because as I just mentioned, 12, 15 years of brain mapping, there is no map around. I think it would be fair to try work on this uh, for a few years. Okay, thank you. We have another question. This may be similar to this question that you just answered, but I'll ask it anyway. How can one image a human brain with reasonable efforts? So reasonable efforts would be um, potentially not image the whole brain like we want to do, but partially, you know, make it centimeter slices or take out some regions, hippocampus, cortex, amygdala. You know, we could already image the kidney, which is actually very significant, but big. So by imaging the region of interest, which is also not done so far, we could be reasonably getting some good data. Okay, we've got some more audience questions. Um, amazing results. Um, Apart um, the very ambitious application you described, 3D organs, are there any diagnostic applications that can be performed with light sheet microscopy? Yeah, so there could be, um, that's good. One, you know, exciting application in general of tissue transparency technologies, just not to look at nice pictures, but also do diagnostics. For example, could be biopsies, could be analyzed in a much better way now because we don't have to do sections and look at tiny pieces of biopsy, but we could do whole biopsy transparent label and look at all the cells, cancer cells, and for better diagnostic staging of the cancer and maybe better treatment uh, options suggesting. So this is uh, actually coming up. We are working on this kind of application. This is not only light sheet microscopy, but also a lot of AI. It should be involved because when it becomes large data, especially in human tissue, there's a lot of background. And we are working on AI algorithms that can overcome and reliably analyze what we are seeing in this large human uh, data for diagnostic purposes. Okay, we have another question. Um, what are the current Oh, never mind. I just asked that one. Um, I'm sorry, I got off track. Um, was there any autofluorescence issue? If yes, how is it resolved? So there was a good autofluorescence issue <laughs> in human tissue actually a lot. Um, that is sometimes helpful. You can see specific structures, sometimes annoying. It's too much. If you would want to do additional antibody labeling and so on, it's hard to decide what is specific, what is not. So we um, could use copper sulfate as an uh, agent that reduces autofluorescence, but in the paper, in Shannon's paper, we showed it is working in, in small size of tissue. Unfortunately, we couldn't apply it to whole organ level yet. 
So there are a few methods to reduce the autofluorescence. Um, one could um, need to test. We are also working partially on it. That's one way, but other way could be to generate props that goes more far in spectra because autofluorescence usually comes in green and red spectra if you go and go near infrared, far red, and short wavelength, we would potentially also work on autofluorescence. Okay, our next question is, which clearing method is recommended for doing multiplex antibody staining and preserving endogenously expressed fluorescence reporter proteins? Um, okay, so I could talk about only um, this core line of clearing, which we use mainly, because they're really potent in large tissue. In slices, maybe there are some alternatives, but in large tissue, they are, I guess, at the moment, for me, at least the most reliable. Multi-round labeling um, of the specific antibodies for mouse organs. I mean, we don't actually <laughs> have a published protocol, I must admit here. Um, there are um, protocols um, published um, for slices, but not for a um, mouse organ yet. And um, I cannot really answer this question because actually if there is no solution yet for a mouse organ level for slices, okay, one could try the speech protocol. Um, but of course, there are some limitations there. One just has to check um, as, as usual in uh, many other technologies. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Let's see. How long does it take in general for someone to learn the skills necessary for AI analysis of, analysis of samples, specifically for people with no computer science background? Good, so I will answer this question a bit differently. Um, there are sometimes people asking in biology, what should I do? I'm bored with this field. <laughs> you know, my response is just learn how to uh, program you know, machine learning. You need to learn Python, which is relatively easy to get in. And it, you know, still starting now, one could become expert of it in half year, one year, then you can find job anywhere as an AI expert also in biology background. So in a way, um, someone could uh, get all this, you know, necessary knowledge background potentially in a year or so, I would guess. Um, to be expert, of course, takes always longer. But usually what we do is we, I work um, I, in my group, there are six computer scientists. There are computer scientists with machine learning background. They work on the projects. So for this, the easiest way, if you want to tackle big problems in a short time, it's better to work together instead of just learning it. Either learn it, do it, or just uh, do, let it, the experts do it for you. So find a greater lab or person going to do it for you. Okay, perfect. What is the next question is what is the largest sample that has been imaged? So the largest sample we imaged was the um, uh, human kidney. I think about 11 centimeters length, um, five centimeters width, and a four centimeters thick. So that's the really the largest sample ever image of fluorescent microscopy. and microscopy. I'm proud to say. So um, if you would have a um, microscope that is can handle larger samples we could even emit sam larger samples we have some other organs like lungs very transparent and even larger but they're not emit that there is no such a microscope yet okay great we have another question um, how does deep learning work in your approaches so this is not easy to answer i guess in a short time so deep learning, machine learning, deep learning is a part of machine learning. It learns from or uh, data. That means there is biologists, let's say, start um, putting labels onto data, looking at the microscopy data, says, okay, so make circles, here are the cells, as good as possible. Then we train the algorithms, saying, okay, here expert tells the structures are cells. And then you show different samples, like the so-called ground truth, and you train the algorithms. And algorithms then extract hundreds, even thousands of parameters. Why did it sell? Is it size, 3D shape, um, whatever this intensity in 3D space, all these things adds up. And then actually 
it's like human being they learn to judge by themselves what is the effect of the self after doing a lot of training so it works like this again it's really computer science uh, science um, 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 thing I would highly recommend to learn more about it for anyone This question is about um, multiple colors imaging. Maximum, how many colors can you separate using your current setting? Um, we can separate for five maximum. I mean, we use four okay, five we didn't really do. Three we can easily do. I say if you push it to the four. Um, so this is, I think, about the limit. So it's not very easy for very large tissue to split. Um, uh, a lot of colors so this would be I guess so if possible there should be stripping and relabeling but we haven't done it at organ or mouse level yet okay we have another question is it possible to reuse the cleared samples for other applications like histology or even molecular analysis of DNA so we publish in channel paper you can um, see actually there is the clear kidney image, and then there is the H and E staining afterwards, the rehydration sectioning, and looking at the structures with different labeling technologies. Antibody one we published in DeepMac paper, where we took out the cancer metastasis from the cleared mouse, then <clears throat> made it reverse clearing and antibody labeling. So you can do actually these kind of studies. Just check the papers, the Chanel paper and DeepMac paper. Okay, that's great, thank you. I have another question from the audience. Um, can you obtain cellular detail in any organ tested thus far? Um, cellular detail, so it's, um, yes, for example, the human eye, I showed you individual immune cells. In kidney, we didn't uh, label, um, actually we have um, a top or tree labeling individual cells. In glomeruli, they are clustered. We have trade-off. If we want to image the whole thing, we have to go a little bit lower resolution. <clears throat> but then it's like Google Map. After having a mid-sized view, we can immediately change the new objective. Now, I guess uh, in Blaze, you can do this without touching the sample. Then you can zoom in and get even subcellular de details. But to be able to image complete kidney at cell level, at this point, I guess we don't really have a solution yet. Okay, looks like I have time for a few more questions. What else can be done with the VDISCO technology? Um, so this is, I think, very exciting for us in general because a lot of animal models, um, diseases are you know, models on mouse from neurodegeneration, like ALS, you can study peripheral neurodegeneration, diabetics, inflammation, cancer metastasis, anything you think would affect the, you know, like metabolic disease could benefit from VDISCO technology. And then antibody track tar is targeting of any disease, small molecules, CAR T cell, all these things could be potentially uh, benefiting from VDISCO technology. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Let's see. How can you create human organs based on the results of human organ mapping? So, yeah, this is um, a wish yet, not reality, but there is a vision there. Um, for me, I describe it like this, that imagine you want to make a complicated skyscraper, what you would need first. You don't need the person who makes the concrete, glass, or wires. You need the architect who gave you the plan. Then you move to recruiting the people you need, right? Exactly like this, we need a map of an organ to understand how many capillaries per glomeruli for kidney and all the distance each other, the, from small vessels to large vessels, how this pipeline works. When we understand that we have a mathematical formula, what does it mean to be a, a, a part of a kidney? We can replicate it, otherwise, just putting stem cells, iPSCs onto dish and expecting them they will behave like human organs is really just a wish 
as we know now, all the organoids feel they are stuck at um, that there is huge heterogeneity, but not as well as, well as there is core, uh, that core of the tissue after a few millimeters, the core is totally dead. So basically, it is hard to get a large scale human tissue by random organization in 3D space. So clearly our organs, they are organized in a specific way with 3D architecture. And if we can replicate this, we will be much closer to getting something, uh, imi some imitation in dish that we can use for human disease, modeling human diseases. Thank you, Ali. Do you have any final comments for our audience? So, um, well, I mean, treating fit definitely, I would say, it's going to have a much more impact than you, I guess, in general, you would think, hopefully, um, because it really provides an unbiased view on structure and potentially more and more to the molecules that we can understand study diseases now in a very different way. I think this is very exciting, as I showed in cancer metastasis, seeing all tiny metastasis and all drug targeting. It is, it's a different game now. It's not anymore prediction. Just by looking at large tumors, which drug is going to work, from prediction, we know we move to knowing. We see every cancer cell, and we know if antibodies drug is working or not. I think this is a really powerful uh, technology now in core could be applying to different diseases. And I'm very excited to see how it will really change drug development process in, in the coming years and potentially help getting much more success in clinical trials because, again, we are moving from prediction to knowing. I think this is very exciting. Thank you again, Ali, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Miltenia Biotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's time for replay. If you would like to know how to get easy access to these fascinating technologies, please join the webinar from sample prep to high-res light sheet microscopy, simplify 3D imaging on December 1st and December 3rd, hosted by Miltenyi Biotech. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>